said stupid you look like you could use a friend and stupid says that's great i ain't never had me one of them then stupid said that evil how does this friendship work and evil says it's easy you just stick your head down in the dirt so stupid dug a hole and stuck his head down in the sand and evil had free brain to carry out his wicked plan live on behalf of the federal society student division and the boston college law school federal society chapter welcome to tonight's betty night fight between rafael manguel and clark neely my name is Jill Jacobson, and I'm the president of the FedSoc chapter at BC Law. I'm honored to introduce our distinguished fighters as well as our referee. First up, our referee, Mr. William, Philip Williamson. Philip is a litigation partner at Taft in Cincinnati, Ohio. Prior to joining Taft, Philip was a professional nomad, clerking for Judge, Judge Kethledge at the Sixth Circuit, Judge Thapar then at the Eastern District of Kentucky, and Judge Smith at the Eighth Circuit. He is, a, he is an alum of the University of Virginia School of Law. Next, we have Mr. Clark Neely. Clark is Senior Vice President for Legal Studies at the Cato Institute. His areas of interest include constitutional law, overcriminalization, course of plea bargaining, police accountability, and gun rights. Before joining Cato in 2017, Clark was a senior attorney and constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice and director of the Institute's Center for Judicial Engagement. He served as co-counsel in DCV Heller and is also the author of Terms of Engagement, how our court should enforce the Constitution's promise of limited government. He is an alum of the University of Texas School of Law, where he was chief articles editor of the Texas Law Review. Finally, we have Mr. Rafael Manguel. Rafael is the Nick O'Neill Fellow and Head of Research for Policing and Public Safety at the Manhattan Institute. He is also the author of Criminal Injustice, What the Push for Decarceration and Depolicing Gets Wrong and Who It Hurts Most. In addition to his book, Raphael has been published and has appeared in a wide array of media outlets, including the New York Times, Fox, C-SPAN, MSNBC, The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and City Journal Magazine, where he is also a contributing editor. Raphael has testified before committees of both houses of Congress, was elected to the Council on Criminal Justice in 2022, and in 2020 was appointed to a four-year term on the New York State Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Upon his graduation from DePaul University's College of Law, he was inducted into the Order of Barristers. At the end of this evening's debate, we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. You must be logged in as a participant in the Zoom webinar in order to ask a question. Feel free to use the raise hand function in Zoom to enter the queue. When we get to your question, our moderator will call on you by name and the Zoom host will unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question. If you're calling in from a phone, you can press star nine on your phone to raise your hand and feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions as well. And with that, I will hand it over to our distinguished moderator, Philip Williamson. Thank you so much. And, and I wanna thank the Boston College student chapter uh, for hosting this 22nd Betty Night Fight. Uh, could not be more thrilled to, to get to moderate this debate tonight. Uh, and to, to be joined by two gentlemen that I respect greatly, uh, despite some, some pretty widely divergent uh, views on the question that we're going to be tackling tonight. I just want to say from the outset, uh, for those of you that, that may be new to the Federalist Society, it is a group of conservatives and libertarians uh, that are committed to the principle that the state exists to preserve freedom, that, it is in, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. The Federalist Society does not take policy positions, it doesn't endorse candidates, it doesn't promote legislation. Uh, and then you will notice that in our policy debate tonight, uh, it is very much a, a debate happening inside this conservative and libertarian tent. And, and that is what the society is for, is to promote debate so that you as lawyers and law students and the general public can make some informed decisions about you know, how you want your government to operate. Tonight's debate uh, on criminal justice is central to that, you know, that decision-making. Uh, it goes to the very nature of the, the structure and the ends of government in places where the government most impacts your day-to-day -day life. And that is your safety uh, and your interaction or the interaction of your friends the interaction of the public with the criminal justice system. So with that, uh, a couple of ground rules for our combatants this evening. I'd like a good clean fight. 
I'm going to limit you to hawking your book or your articles once per five minutes of speech. Uh, we're going to open with uh, five minute, five to seven minute speeches from, from both of our combatants, kind of setting the stage on where we're going. Uh, then they're going to take about 10 minutes a piece to, to lay out their thesis on how we solve some of these problems, to the, solve some of the problems they identify. And then five or seven minutes a piece uh, to, to respond to each other's points. And then we'll throw it open to Q&A. Uh, I'll forewarn you, violation of any of the rules of the debate tonight will result in a member of the Boston College student chapter being dispatched to a location to be to about the head and shoulders with a loss with a yardstick. Uh, so with that, we can ring our opening bell, turn it over to Raphael. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that that introduction and for, and for having me here. So uh, I'll just get right into it. Um, you know, in terms of the problem, for well over a decade now, uh, a particular narrative about crime and justice in the United States has taken hold and has really been driving policy at the national level, the state level, local agency levels, etc. And that narrative basically posits that justice has essentially been expelled from virtually every institution tasked with providing for the public safety, or as Clark has put it, the criminal justice system is, quote, rotten to its core. Now, from where I sit, this narrative rests on three fundamental claims. The first of those is that America takes a draconian approach to criminal punishment, evidenced by what critics often refer to as a mass incarceration crisis. And basic logic tells us that the way that that crisis is formulated, uh, those who level that critique do so in pursuit of a particular remedy, and that is mass decarceration, which is important. The second claim is that this over-incarceration problem is driven in part by law enforcement institutions that are over that are overly reliant on uh, unjustifiable violence. And the third fundamental claim undergirding the dominant narrative about justice in America is that both the mass incarceration incarceration and police violence problems fall disproportionately on the shoulders of low-income minority communities affecting Black men more than any other group, thereby constituting prima facie evidence of racism in what is colloquially referred to as the criminal justice system. Now, um, what makes me say that this narrative has become dominant? A few things. One, the claims that I just described are the claims that color how these issues are covered in legacy media outlets like the New York Times, NPR, and the Washington Post. They are the claims driving how these issues are presented in academic institutions, and they are the claims undergirding an unmistakable trend in policy since at least 2010, a trend that is characterized by the systematic lowering of the transaction costs of crime commission, as well as the elevation of the transaction costs of law enforcement. Now, evidence of that trend includes, but is certainly not limited to, one, a 24% decline in the nation's prison population between 2010 and 2021, a 15% decline in the national jail population during that same period, a 25% decline in arrests nationwide between 2009 and 2019, a years-long police recruitment and retention crisis that is hitting particularly urban jurisdictions uh, hard, an explosion in the electoral success of what's become known as the progressive prosecutor movement, such that some 40 million Americans now live in jurisdictions with prosecutors who campaign as reformers first and law enforcement officials second, and a slew of police and criminal justice reforms at all levels of government characterized by policy shifts that either restrict police power, so think here of bans on pursuit, scrappling techniques like neck restraints, defunding efforts, and unfunded reporting requirements, or uh, policies that make prosecutions and incarcerations less likely to occur and less severe when they do occur. So think of bail, discovery, and sentencing reforms, decriminalization efforts, raise the age laws, and parole reforms. Now, what I want to argue tonight is twofold. One, the fundamental claims that I just highlighted are wrong in very many respects. Two, the push for decarceration and depolicing that stems from those errors comes with an enormous amount of downside risk that is already coming to pass. Why do I say that? Well, in 2020, the United States saw the largest one-year spike in homicides recorded in more than 100 years, 30%. That measure, as estimated by the Department of Justice, rose again in 2021, albeit by not as much. And a more recent estimate based on data from a select group of cities suggests that the country probably saw a modest decline in homicides in 2022, somewhere in the range of 5%, which would leave us where we were at the end of 2020. But here's the thing. When we're talking about the homicide spike here in the U.S., it's very important to keep in mind what these national numbers obscure, which is that homicides are not evenly distributed just like crime isn't. And to illustrate why this is important, I want you to recall that in response to those who express concern about the homicide spike in 2020, 
Many defenders of the reforms that preceded the spike were very quick to note that despite the spike, the homicide rate was still much lower than it was when it peaked in the early 1990s. And this is true in the aggregate, but we don't live in the aggregate, which means that where you are matters quite a bit. And so while the national homicide count might not be as high as it once was, more than a dozen American cities have seen homicide counts that are as high as they've ever been in those jurisdictions. Now, the other thing to remember is that serious violence, as well as crime generally, is both geographically and demographically hyper-concentrated within very small pockets of American cities, big, medium, and small. Now, this has been the case for a long time, and there's actually something called the rule of crime concentration in the criminological literature. And that rule basically finds in analyses that have been replicated across the country that about 5% of a city's street segments will see about 50% of that city's violence. Here in New York, where I sit today, somewhere between 3.7 and 4.2% of street segments see 50 percent of the violence about one percent of street segments see 25 percent of the violence now astoundingly the person who formulated the rule of crime concentration found that here in new york in 2010 15 and 20 40 percent of new york city street segments didn't see any crime whatsoever now when it comes to violent crime it doesn't just matter where you are but also who you are and the sad fact of the matter is that the most serious kind of criminal violence is heavily concentrated among black and latino males how heavily well, every year for which we have data here in New York, a minimum, a minimum of 95% of all shooting victims are either Black or Hispanic. In 2021, the most recent year for which we have data, that number was 97%. Nationally, the Black male homicide victimization rate is 10 times the white homicide victimization rate for men. And for those of you who might be inclined to point out, again, that despite the recent homicide spikes, the country is still way off from the bad old days in the 1990s, understand that this is not the case for Black men, whose firearm homicide rate in 2021 was as high as it's ever been, which is almost double than what it was 10 years ago. Now, to put an even finer note on this point, consider the fact that in 2019, Chicago, where I went to law school, where my wife's originally from, the 10 safest neighborhoods in that city had a collective homicide rate of 1.6 per 100,000. The 10 most dangerous neighborhoods, by contrast, had a homicide rate of 61.7 per 100,000. And high as that number is, it's less than half the rate of the city's worst neighborhood that year, West Garfield Park, which posted a tear-jerking 131.9 per 100,000. Now, here's something else that Chicago's 10 most dangerous uh, neighborhoods uh, uh, tells you. On average, those neighborhoods are close to 96% Black and Latino. Now, why does this kind of concentration matter? Three reasons. One, understanding where crime concentrates and among whom is central to devising an effective approach to crime control. Two, these data allow us to understand just who stands to gain the most should a particular policy program like decarceration and depolicing reduce or exacerbate crime. And crucially, the reality of crime concentration provides important context for understanding the disparities the purveyors of the systemic racism argument latch onto when prosecuting their case against the system. Because if law enforcement resources are disproportionately deployed in response to a problem that's hyper-concentrated in small slices of jurisdictions where certain demographic groups are overrepresented, then the mere fact of disparity within enforcement statistics does not carry very much explanatory power. Now, there's other crime uh, that's going up beyond uh, homicides. But I want to talk just a, a bit in the, the last minute that I have about what I think uh, about the fundamental claims undergirding the reform movement that, that is really driving policy today. When it comes to mass incarceration, that critique fundamentally misunderstands and in fact often misstates the reality of who it is that goes to prison in the United States and how long they actually spend there and what the risk profile is of the typical person in jail or prison. When it comes to police violence, what we see is the use of data that is taken drastically out of context. And when you contextualize police use of force data uh, within the context of the overall volume of police activity, that cuts a big hole in the rhetorical case uh, that that's prosecuted against police. And when it comes to systemic racism, the most important thing uh, that we have in the way of data is something that often gets left out of that conversation. And that is who benefits when the criminal justice system achieves its stated ends. And I think when you consider those three things, which I'm sure we'll expound on throughout the course of this debate, um, you, know, you, you will see that the, the misguided nature of the push for decarceration and depolicing. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Clark? Well, I appreciate it. Thank you to uh, Phil and, and, and Ralph and the FedSoc team for having us on that. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I've done a lot of public policy in my legal career as a public interest lawyer, including 
um, uh, school choice for many years. And also, of course, I was uh, and have been active uh, in the Second Amendment area. And what I've learned from that work is um, lawyers are really, really bad at social science. And lawyers who are not trained in social science are especially bad at it. And you have to be very, very careful uh, when lawyers start doing social science. And so um, to some extent, I think Ralph and I are going to, I hope we don't talk past each other, um, but I'm not trained in social science and Ralph is not trained in social science. Neither of us has that background. And so what I think lawyers are better at is analyzing systems, identifying systematic problems, identifying rules that either work or don't work. Um, and that's more where I'm going to focus. And I want to try to explain um, or, or show that I'm not trying to dodge an argument. I'm just simply saying that I think it's a, it's very fraught um, to, to have a debate uh, about social science when neither of the participants are really social scientists. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, Ralph mentioned that there's a police recruitment and retention problem, which there is, but guess what he didn't tell you? There's a government employee recruitment and retention problem. Um, it turns out that far fewer people are interested in going into government service these days, and it's not just police that are having difficulty attracting uh, new hires. It's firefighters, uh, it's bus drivers, it's across the spectrum. So um, it, it certainly is true that it's become more difficult to hire police, but that is a tiny uh, uh, part of the larger picture. And of course, if the larger picture had been presented, then we'd have a different context here. Um, same thing with police retiring. We've heard all, all, all these stories about police retiring. Some people will say, oh, that's because, you know, there's this narrative that people, um, you know, are angry at police and they don't um, uh, feel uh, valued and so forth anymore. And I'm sure that's true to some extent, but guess what else you wouldn't know unless somebody told you. And that is that um, in most police departments, the amount of your retirement benefits are dependent upon the salary that you earned in your last year or two on the force. And when you have a couple of years with a bunch of overtime, like we had during COVID, that is an excellent time to retire because you're going to lock in those much higher benefits. Again, that would be information that I think you'd want to know, but that would be easy not to present if we want to create a, a, a picture that we're having a real crisis of, of recruitment and retention with police. Um, and I could go on and on, uh, but I, I hope the point uh, is made. Um, you have to be extraordinarily careful um, when you when you try to do social science around police. I'll give you one more example. Um, the real question here is not whether to have police. It's not whether to have prisons. The real question is really a cost benefit analysis. Now, I think Ralph is excellent at documenting costs, and that's actually very easy to do. Um, we, we do have a significant crime problem. Um, we assign police to deal with that problem, and occasionally they do a pretty good job. But I don't think that's really the, the question that we should be asking ourselves, because it's far too easy a question. We should hold ourselves to a higher standard. We're federal society types. We should answer hard questions, not easy ones. A harder question is whether uh, how the cost-benefit analysis shakes out. So are police doing a tremendously effective job, as, as Ralph, I think, suggests? Is our system of incarceration doing a very effective job, as, again, I think he suggests? Um, and I personally think the answer is no. I think if you look at the actual numbers, if you do a real cost-benefit analysis, what you discover is that police in this country are much more like other types of public works and public employees. Um, so public choice, for example, or public schools, for example, I said I worked on that for a while. I've had endless debates with, with uh, proponents of public education who will tell you all of the different things that they managed to accomplish. And guess what? Public schools absolutely do manage to accomplish things just like police do. But are they good at it? That's the real question. Are they effective at expending tax dollars to achieve a result? That's the real question. Public schools, in my judgment, are not effective at expending public do uh, dollars to get a result. And in general, I think the same is true of police. They do, in some sense, get the job done, but they do, do they get the job done in a cost-effective manner? And I think that is a much more difficult, but much more relevant question. I was going to give one more illustration, and it is this. It is very easy to throw around numbers and to pretend as though we have specific and reliable data about important questions surrounding police, but make no mistake, we don't. And how do we know that? Well, one way we know that is if you tried to figure out uh, uh, what would seem like a very simple question that, of course, we would know the answer to, how many people are shot and killed by police every year? Guess what? You're not going to be able to find that number. You're not going to get an accurate number from the FBI, even though they try to track it. You're not going to get an accurate number from any of the police organizations that also, in theory, track that information. You are going to have to assemble that information the way that reporters have done by literally going and looking at hospital admissions, by looking at pathology reports, by looking at morgues, um, just to get 
anything close to a reliable figure on such a simple question, how many pe people do police shoot and kill? We don't know the answer to that. And think about all of the other things we don't know the answer to if we can't even answer that very simple question. I'll give you a couple of examples of things that should really trouble us. What should really trouble us is um, what are the costs when we put more police on the street? Ralph will tell you that one of the benefits is that we generally get a decrease in crime. I agree with that. But what he won't talk about, or at least he hasn't until now, is what are the costs? Because they're not just out-of-pocket costs. They're not just the incredible expense of police. Art. And they are very expensive. Even if we don't pay them all that much, they are expensive. And by the way, let's be clear, we spend more money on public safety than any other country in the world. Um, and, and the amount of money that we spent on police between 2018, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 2000, uh, in the last 40 years, uh, has actually tripled. So this idea that we're radically depolicing or, di or diminishing uh, the amount of money that we spend on public safety or police is just not tenable. Um, but the real question is, what are the costs, right? Here's a really simple question. How often do police victimize people while they're on the job? How often do they commit crimes? There was just an article about a uh, Louisville um, a Municipal Police Department officer um, who uh, a grand jury refused to indict, not because he hadn't committed crimes, uh, but because the specific statute he was charged under um, was unable to cover those crimes. His uh, reports uh, of, of his uh, sexual predation of his confidential informants goes all the way back to 2016. He was investigated and cleared. They never even bothered to look at the text messages between him and the victim. Um, we have example after example of something that happens fairly regularly in this country that virtually never happens in any other developed country, and that's police officers murdering people. I'm not talking about shooting somebody in a dark alley when they made a furtive gesture. I'm talking about murdering people. The way Michael Slager murdered Michael Scott in 2015, the way police uh, sat on Tony Timpa in Dallas, Texas until he asphyxiated and died in 2016, the way Louisiana State uh, Police beat uh, Ronald Green to death in 2019 and murdered him, the way police murdered George Floyd, the way per police appear to have murdered Tyree Nichols in 2023. These things do not happen in other countries. And somebody has to answer the question, why are American police so violent um, so often? And again, I'd be the first to acknowledge that policing is dangerous and difficult work, no question about it. But there is a huge difference between the kinds of highly fraught, questionable shootings where you don't really know what happened in the back alley and police literally murdering somebody uh, in the course of their jobs. We don't know how often that happens. And don't let anybody tell you differently because a country that doesn't even know how often police shoot and kill people in the line of duty certainly can't tell you how often they beat people to death um, or maybe not even to death, maybe just beat them to the point where they're in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. I'll finish by saying this. Um, I agree absolutely that we need policing in this country because we have a crime problem like any country does. I also agree that at least some people who are arrested, prosecuted, and convicted need to go to prison. Where my disagreement is, is that I don't think that we've done a serious cost-benefit analysis in terms of what we're getting for the amount of money that we're spending on police and what we're getting for the amount of money that we're spending in order to be the leading incarcerator of human beings on the planet, which we are and have been for the past 30 years. We don't just incarcerate people a little bit more than other uh, developed countries. We incarcerate people at a rate that's four to six times higher in places like Canada, the UK, and Australia. Maybe that's necessary. I'm not convinced that it is. I don't think that it is a statistic of which any of us should be proud. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. So before we get sort of fully into rebuttal, <clears throat> Raphael, you've kind of you've identified that you know one of the core problems here is that as we make a move towards decarceration, as we are seeing any of a number of you know broadly progressive or liberal reforms to policing and to criminal justice, uh, what we're seeing is the cost of increased crime being borne by you know predominantly minority communities. So. What do you propose we do to solve this problem for minority communities? I mean, there there are a couple of things that I think we we need to do, um, and one of them is to really understand like what part of this is is just completely misunderstood. Um, so you know, 
for example, the, the the mass incarceration meme, right? This idea that the you know the United States is the 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 leading uh, incarcerator in the world, and and we're just supposed to be unfavorably compared to other Western European democracies, and this is supposed to, you know, uh, point us in a policy direction. You know, I think Clark was right to point out that you know. Uh, that, that he doesn't have social science training. I think it's just interesting that in the next breath, he purports to know the answer to a cost benefit analysis, which is really a social science question. Um, but, but you know, he, he illustrates his lack of social science training when he makes that kind of comparison, because at the root of the lot of a lot of the policy levers that we pulled in the last few years is this fundamental misunderstanding, right? Take the idea that the United States is 5% of the world's population, but 25% of its prisoners, a statistic I've heard Clark repeat on multiple occasions, you know, we're unfavorable compared to Western European democracies. This doesn't control for the basic thing that you need to control for when you're doing that kind of analysis, and that's crime disparity, right? One of the things that people often uh, remember within the context of other debates is that the United States also has a lot more of the serious crime that will land you in prison anywhere in the world if you're convicted in those places where we have a ton of gun crime. I mean, I, I did a, a, an analysis in the book um, where I highlight uh, just four tiny slices, uh, a, a handful of tiny slices in four American cities and found that, you know, Collectively, they had a population of about 470,000 people, uh, which is about you know less than 0.5 percent of the population combined of Germany, the uh, England, and Wales. And yet, that little slice of America had 10 percent of all the homicides seen in those three countries, with a combined population of 142 million people. When you control for the basic thing that you need to control for in an analysis uh, of of incarceration disparities, that thing being crime, uh, you start to see that America is actually not such an outlier after all. Um, so, you know, number one is that we have to just have a higher quality debate when it comes to criminal justice policy, and that actually means understanding what the data do and don't say, um, uh, uh, and, and to be better at that. But basically, what I think we need to do is kind of pump the brakes on this push to essentially empty jails and prisons and reduce the powers of police. I mean, you know, Clark, uh, I, I'm glad that he at least acknowledges that the overwhelming weight of the research on policing uh, shows that it reduces crime. Uh, but not only does it show that, it also looks at the return on investment, right? There are studies actually doing exactly the kind of cost-benefit analysis that Clark calls for. One study done by a, a scholar named Aaron Chalfin, who's in the criminology department at the University of Pennsylvania, found that for every dollar spent on policing in 2010, uh, there was a dollar and 63 cent return on that investment that came primarily in the form of reduced victimization costs, mostly through homicide reduction. Chalfin, along with Morgan Williams, who's at Columbia, um, did another study that came out just a couple of years ago, which found that for every single uh, police officer hired, you abate 0.1 homicides a year, meaning for every 10 cops you hire, uh, you reduce uh, uh, one homicide per year, which is a pretty significant benefit, especially when you consider that the effect is twice as large um, uh, for the Black community, which again, bears the brunt of that problem. So you know what I want to do with, I think I have, what, five or six minutes to... Uh, Kind of push back here. What I want to do is just kind of talk a little bit about what you know the the mass incarceration and police violence claims uh, really get wrong. And so when it comes to mass incarceration, again, you you have this idea that that we're an international outlier, but the reality is is that we're not more punitive necessarily than places like the UK or Germany. Germany sentences a higher proportion of people convicted of first degree murder to life in prison than does the U.S. In the U.K., the mandatory minimum sentence for illegal gun possession is five years, of which you have to serve a minimum of three and a half. That's a that's a, a crime regularly met. With with sentences of probation in the United States today, right? I think the best way to test the idea that we have uh, a mass car of course, the lights just went out here. Give me one second. We're on a, uh, I'm in, I'm, I'm a very still person. And so, uh, you know, the, the motion sensor uh, didn't catch on. But the best way to test whether we have a mass incarceration problem is to ask the question, can we safely decarcerate on mass? And before you answer that, I think you have to consider the fact that in 2021, 62.4% of state prisoners who account for about nine out of every 10 prisoners in the country were incarcerated primarily for a violent felony. If you add weapons offenders, you get two thirds of state prisoners. Consider also that on average, uh, state prisoner uh, have, they, they have between 10 and 12 prior arrests and five and six prior convictions uh, when they're released. Then I want you to consider the fact that over a 10-year period, 80 to 83 percent of release state prisoners will be rearrested at least once. On average, they'll be rearrested five times over that decade, which is a number that has to be viewed in light of the fact that A, the vast majority of crime doesn't get reported, and B, the vast majority of crime that does get reported uh, doesn't uh, get cleared, which is to say that doesn't result in an arrest. So the recidivism rate drastically understates the criminal activity of uh, uh, people who have been released from, from state correctional facilities. The other thing that the criminal history and recidivism data 
tell us is that just because someone is incarcerated for a nonviolent crime today doesn't mean that they haven't committed a violent crime in the past or that they won't commit one tomorrow, right? This highlights one of the most important functions that, Christmas, that uh, prisons serve, and that is incapacitation. All right, when you are pursuing the kind of decarceration that people like Clark implicitly want to pursue by comparing us to Western European democracies uh, that, you know, if we were to achieve carceral parity with them would require us to release about 60 to 70 percent of our prisoners, that would leave many hardened offenders free to victimize their communities in ways that they couldn't if they were locked up. Now, a recent study modestly estimated that for the period of 1991 to 2004, society was spared eight index felonies for every single year that the typical prisoner was behind bars. And this is a study done by a very credentialed social scientist, uh, so not by me, right? And crime data consistently shows that a massive amount of serious crime is committed by repeat offenders with active criminal justice statuses and unbelievably lengthy criminal histories. In the city of Chicago, uh, an analysis of 2015 and 16 data done by the University of Chicago Crime Lab found that on average, someone charged with a shooting or a homicide in that city had 12 prior arrests. 20%, one in five of them had more than 20 prior arrests. Data from uh, the Department of Justice looking at the period of, of 1990 to 2002 found that more than 36% of convicted violent felons were either out on probation, parole, or pretrial release at the time that they committed their offense. So this is all of this, none of this is reflected in the tenor uh, of our debate about incarceration. And you see the same thing with respect to policing, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? Like Clark will say these things in one breath and then contradict them in the, in the next, right? He says we don't have, you know, enough data to even have a sense of, of, you know, police shootings, but then goes on to say that, you know, police murder happens regularly in basically the same breath, right? Yeah, we don't know precisely how many people are, are shot by police in a given year, but we have enough data to give us an idea. We have big jurisdictions that do actually a relatively good job of, of reporting data from which we can extrapolate relatively reasonable conclusions, right? And, and so, you know, we have these databases kept by the Washington Post. You have fatal encounters mapping police violence, and they tell us that police uh, shoot and kill about a thousand people a year, which, you know, sounds like a lot, right? I did an analysis based on 2018 data, of both fatal and non-fatal police shootings, and I extrapolated that uh, police could be, have been estimated to fire their weapons purposefully some 3,000 times in 2018, which again, sounds like a lot. We have 365 days a year. That's multiple shootings a day. Uh, but when you contextualize that within the overall volume of police activity, 686,000 cops that year who made 10.3 million arrests had 75 million public contacts with people over the age of 16, right? The idea that we don't have enough data to know whether there's a delta between the narrative and the reality, um, I, I think that's just that's just wrong. We do, right? The, there have been very detailed studies of police use of force in this country. One that looked at three different jurisdictions in uh, North Carolina, Arizona, and Louisiana, looked at a million calls for service that resulted in 114,000 criminal arrests. Police use force in just one out of every 128 of those arrests, meaning that more than 99% of those arrests went off without a hitch, without the use of force whatsoever. And in 98% of the cases in which force was used, a team of doctors who reviewed the medical records of the, the, the people who were arrested on intake at the county jail categorized their injuries as either none or mild. Right? A very, very small percentage had serious injuries. And in that entire data set, there was just one fatal police shooting. Right, Take New York City, which is actually a little uh, higher on the spectrum. Right, In 2021, they fielded 6.4 million calls for service. They made over 166,000 criminal arrests. They only used force 5,000 times. That's 3% of all arrests. Right, you you and and the vast majority of the the force cases that they use were level one uses of force, which is you know just basically taking somebody down to the ground forcefully. They discharged their firearms just thirty six times that year. They killed less than ten people, which is represents, by the way, a lot of progress. In, in nineteen seventy one, which is the first year that the NYPD started keeping data, the NYPD reported that they shot and wounded two hundred and twenty some odd people. They killed almost a hundred. So all of these things have, have really been moving in the right direction, and yet we don't see that reflected at all in the debate. And so the last thing I want to say here is just in, in terms of how we understand the systemic racism critique, here again um, is where I think we have to be a little better about data, right? I mean, there are tons and tons of uh, racial disparities that you can point to, top-line disparities in the enforcement data, right? Black men are five times as likely as white men to be imprisoned in the United States. They're, you know, they use drugs at the same rate, but they're X, you know, times more likely to be arrested 
arrested for those drug crimes. This, we're told, is prima facie evidence of racism cooked into the system. But but it only it's it's a bad analysis. Why is it a bad analysis? Because it only looks at one side of the ledger. It pretends that the only output of the criminal justice system is enforcement, and that's not true. When the criminal justice system does what it's designed to do, and that is reduce crime, you have to look at the dispersion of those benefits. And guess what? Those benefits are just as unequally distributed as the costs associated with the operation of those uh, enforcement apparatuses, right? So, you know, Patrick Sharkey, who's someone I disagree with uh, on criminal justice policy, did an analysis of the homicide decline between 1990 and 2014. He found that it added a full year of life expectancy to the average Black man's life in the United States and only added 0.14 years of life expectancy to the average white man. Right. And so when you actually look at the other side of the ledger and incorporate uh, the benefits uh, into the analysis, I think you know, you're left with a, a tough question to answer. And that is why on earth would a system allegedly designed and operated for the specific oppression of low income minority communities so disproportionately benefit those communities when the system achieves its stated ends? Ask any police chief in the country. What is it that you want to achieve? How do you define success? They say they want to reduce crime, but they're racist. That doesn't make any sense, given the fact that the people bearing the burden of that crime are black and brown, and the people who stand to benefit if that crime goes down are black and brown. But but our our analyses don't reflect this. Our public debate does not reflect this. And so, you know, to me, the most important first step that we can take is to have a more grounded debate that does look at what the data say that analyzes it properly. And if you do that, I think we get closer to the truth and closer to uh, a system that isn't reactive, which is exactly how we make policy right now. You know, a video goes viral, right? George Floyd murdered by a Minneapolis police department, uh, a police officer. In the year following his death, the New York Times reported that 30 states passed over 140 police reforms. That's an enormous amount of movement in a very short period of time, my guess is with very, very little analysis. So we need to stop making policy that way. And if we do that, I think it'll point in the particular direction. And that direction is that we need to do better at drawing and enforcing a line as to repeated criminal conduct and our willingness to, um, to tolerate it. We need to be better at pinpointing our policing resources through the use of data to identify crime hotspots, identify the criminal networks operating within those places, bring cases that are going to stick, and take those people off the street for significant periods of time to maximize the incapacitation benefits. And that doesn't mean a dragnet approach, but it does mean uh, taking the data seriously and going where it points you. So I'll stop there. Clark, uh, uh... I'm going to let you sort of combine both your your solutions and rebuttal, uh, as as Raphael did just now. But sort of listening to your opening remarks, the the, the impression I walked away with is that the fundamental problem is that you know policing, bad policing is real, and it is costly, uh, as is you know high levels of incarceration. It's real and it's costly. So maybe first question for you is what do you do to address that problem? Well, it's great to get a word in edgewise. Thanks, Bill. Um, so, you know, Ralph kind of doubled down on the social science. I'm not going to do that other than to say, um, you know, anybody, anybody can just spew data um, as if it were reliable. Um, you know, for example, don't mention Don Steeman's study, The Prison Paradox, More Incarceration Will Not Make Us Safer, where it indicates that prison um, only provides marginal benefits um, in terms of reduction of, of crime, uh, no real reduction of violent crime, some reduction of, of property crime. Um, I can do this all night long, too, um, but I'm not going to. Um, I could also tell you, for example, that um, my, my German legal associate uh, has told me that uh, life sentences in Germany are almost never served because they have a statutory um, escape valve uh, where almost everybody gets out after 15 years. You're not going to hear that here either. We could do this all night, but we're not going to because I'm not going to do it. I'm not a social scientist. Ralph's not a social scientist. There's just nothing to be gained by this. What we do know is that there are really serious systemic problems in American policing. If you want an image of American policing, how about the police milling around doing nothing um, at, at Robb Elementary in Uvalde uh, last May? How about police hiding behind their own squad car um, at Stoneman Douglas um, in the mass shooting in 2018, or standing around in the parking lot for two hours at Columbine in 1999? Um, I'm not throwing rocks at the institution of policing for those things. I'm saying that those images are endemic. 
they represent serious structural problems in policing that we simply have not addressed. And let's talk about a few of those. Instead of throwing around statistics and leaving stuff out and not telling you the whole picture, let's talk about actual uh, systemic problems in American policing that there's no two ways about. There's no, you, you quote a study, I quote a study, and then we extrapolate on some you know, ragtag department in North Carolina. First of all, police, the most, most police uh, departments um, are unionized, and this is an incredible misjudgment um, because we know uh, from public education unions, from other public uh, employee unions, that this empowers uh, the, the, the vocation in question uh, to affect public policy in a way that promotes its own interests at the expense of the rest of us and in, imposes massive costs uh, on society. I'll give you an example in the police context. Police unions have been extremely uh, effective at negotiating so-called law enforcement officer bill of rights that give them astonishing prerogatives, um, particularly in the wake of uh, what, what they like to call police involved shootings, where for example, an officer cannot be questioned for days after the event. They have to be provided with all of the information known to investigators before the questioning begins, including witness statements, videos, et cetera. Um, which of course is never done with any other uh, uh, suspect or anybody else who's been involved in a violent crime for the obvious reason that it gives them an opportunity to get their stories straight and conform them to the known facts. Um, police have also been extremely effective at neutering so-called citizen oversight uh, entities um, by denying them the ability to subpoena witnesses, um, by, by enabling them to be overruled, by making um, uh, sure that they're unable to access documents, videos, et cetera, and really just unable to go about uh, their jobs. The list goes on and on, but what is undeniable um, is that the unionization of public employees in every sector where it has been tried imposes massive costs on the public while empowering uh, those institutions to advance their own interests, which are often um, in sharp conflict uh, with the rest of us. Um, the other problem, uh, and this leads to another problem, which is accountability. Police accountability is a huge problem in this country. Um, if you want an image of the lack of accountability in police, consider the name Oliver Wiggins. He was a man who was driving his car in New York City in 2014. He was T-boned at a four-way stop uh, by an NYPD SUV containing four NYPD officers. They immediately attempted to frame him for driving under the influence. They gave him a field sobriety test and falsely stated that he failed it. He was then taken to the hospital for his injuries where they did a blood draw and determined that he had zero alcohol in his system, presumably because in fact he didn't drink alcohol. He just didn't drink at all. Um, four years later, uh, Oliver Wiggins got a $1 million settlement from NYPD, and the last sentence of the article that reports that settlement tells you that all four of those officers are still employed by the NYPD after victimizing uh, a resident in New York City, lying about it and trying to frame him for a crime that he didn't commit in order to cover up their own malfeasance. The problem is that we don't know how often that happens. We don't have any idea how often that happens, and nobody can tell you otherwise. You can quote all the statistics that you want, um, and yes, that's anecdotal, fine. But the problem is there's no other way for it to be. Up until just a couple of years ago, you couldn't even get disciplinary records for NYPD officers. Why? Because the NYPD police union made sure that you couldn't get them. The law has been changed, but guess what? They've been fighting like cats in court to prevent that law um, from being effective because they have a very strong interest in preventing the disclosure of their own disciplinary records so that the rest of us can't find out just how often police are allowed to remain on the job after committing astonishing acts uh, of malfeasance. Um, including, for example, the officers who killed Tony Timpa in Dallas, an incident I referred to before, um, where they literally, he called for help. He was not even a suspect. He called for help because he was having a mental health episode. They put him in restraints and sat on him until they suffocated him to death while joking about it. Those officers, at least two of them, have been promoted since then. So we have a massive problem with accountability that is only exacerbated uh, by the court-confected doctrine of qualified immunity, which I'm sure most of the people listening know about, but if you've not heard of it, um, this is a defense that was invented out of whole cloth by the Supreme Court in 1982 in a case called Harlow v. Fitzgerald that enables police who have been plausibly accused of misconduct to assert the defense of qualified immunity and say, in effect, look, it may well be the case that I violated your civil rights, but because there's not a pre-existing case on the books in this jurisdiction where a police officer did a nearly identical thing to a different person and, and, and uh, there's a court ruling say, don't do that exact thing, then I'm entitled to have your case dismissed, even though, yes, technically I violated your civil rights. 
Um, this has been a hot button issue for very good reason because it creates an impression, and I would say an accurate impression, that there is a massive double standard when it comes to the very high levels of accountability to which police hold the rest of us, including even the ability to arrest and convict you uh, for conduct that you didn't even know was a crime. But then when the shoe is on the other foot, police have the ability to assert this judge-made doctrine of qualified immunity that gets them off the hook, even if they it clearly committed a civil rights violation. So this is uh, just yet another example of the accountability problems that we have. I'll, 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 I'll finish with one more thing because I really do want this to be a discussion and it's this. There is a massive problem uh, with deceit in policing. Police are trained, they are actually trained to use deceit in interrogations. It's called the Reed method. It's still a very prominent way uh, that police are trained to do interrogations, to try to trick people into making admissions or other disclosures that are helpful to the police. Um, this bleeds over into all aspects of policing. Police have been recorded being incredibly deceitful with people during traffic stops, including a North Carolina police officer who falsely told an Uber driver that he was not permitted to record the encounter under a new state law. Unluckily for him, the Uber driver turned out to, his day job turned out to be a criminal defense attorney and he knew there was no such law. Um, and that police officer was ultimately disciplined. But guess what? Twist ending. He was then promoted back to his original rank after the dust settled, which is not unusual. Um, so we have a huge example uh, problem with police deceit. I'm going to finish with a, just an article that I encourage everybody to take a look at from the Washington Post in 2023, um, just a week ago, actually, in February 17th. What they looked at was the initial police reports uh, of various encounters where we now know the true facts. This would include the killing of Breonna Taylor, which was initially recorded as no injuries by the police. Um, George Floyd was initially recorded by the police as suffering medical distress. Um, and Tyree Nichols was recorded as having shortness of breath. And of course, we now know in each of those incidents that the police killed those people and in two of them, or at least one of them was found to have murdered uh, the, su the subject and um, uh, police in the Tyree Nichols uh, case are being uh, uh, prosecuted. And then of course, we know that in the Breonna Taylor case, that there, was this, there was just an unbelievable amount of lying and deceit that went into the acquisition of the, of the warrant, further uh, reinforcing this theme that we don't have a solid handle on the cost benefit analysis. I think one needs to be done. I disclosed early on that that is not my forte. And I made clear that I do not intend to have this be a he said, she said social science debate that neither of us are qualified to conduct. But I will say this, it is still an important question to ask, what is the cost benefit analysis here? And are we getting a good rate of return on the very substantial investments that we make um, in policing and public safety? And all I will say is that I am deeply skeptical whether that is the case. We have among the highest prices in the world for things like road construction, public education, and healthcare. And I, there's very little question in my mind that we also play, pay an extremely high and probably unduly high cost for public policing. Um, do we need it? Yes. Could we be getting a lot more for the money? Almost certainly. Well, gentlemen, with, with your permission, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I'm going to assert some referees privilege here uh, and then and open it up to our, our audience for Q&A and maybe some back and forth, back and forth with you guys. Uh, <clears throat> but I'll actually return to the question that I kicked off the section with, which is, so what do we do to address the problems that, that you guys have identified over the last 40 to 45 minutes. And, and I'll frame it this way. Uh, you have a friendly state attorney general or US attorney general, you have carte blanche to change, let's say two things about our criminal justice system to make life better for people. What are you doing? Uh, and Rafael, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, well, if, if my constraints are that I only have two levers to pull, I think the two that make the most sense are those that get at the biggest problems, uh, I think, driving um, uh, the crime spike that we're living through right now. And the first of those things is to invest in policing and not just policing for its own sake, but quality policing. One of the things that I'd really like to see more police departments do is target um, their recruiting efforts at high IQ, psychologically stable people, um, particularly those who have higher educational attainment. There's a lot of social science research out there, which I will keep uh, leaning on because I think it's important uh, not to exclude that from, from these debates. Um, 
that shows that police officers with college degrees use force at significantly lower rates than their counterparts with just high school diplomas. Even when you control for the circumstances of a particular arrest, they have fewer disciplinary marks on their records, even when you control for the type of assignments that they get. Um, you know, so one of the things I want to see is American policing do something like what the military has done, which is create incentives for people who have higher educational attainment, which is correlated with higher IQ, so, you know, psychological stability, to do this kind of job by paying more, giving them a higher promotional ceiling and a more secure track um, uh, that, that, that will be attracted to them. And that's going to take a lot of money. One of the things I think that the 94 crime bill did really, really well was provide a, a, a seed money for jurisdictions across the country to hire some, you know, or repurpose some 70,000 police officers uh, across the country, which was, I think, a really important part of the overall story of America's crime decline um, throughout the 1990s and early aughts, but also, I, I think, informs some of the reasons why we're struggling with police recruitment and retention today. A lot of those people became eligible for retirement after 20 or 25 years, which means 2014 or 2019, which is right around the time that the, you know the, this crime problem really started to peak. So I think that's important. The second thing I think that makes the most sense to do is is, is to have some kind of strike regime. You know, maybe three strikes is the wrong number. Maybe the approach of having one strike for, per conviction is the wrong approach. You know, maybe you get a quarter strike for a misdemeanor conviction and a half a strike for a nonviolent felony conviction. You know, but we have to do a better job of drawing a line in the sand through legislation as to how much repeated criminal conduct we are going to tolerate and then enforce that line and, and, and you know, and take discretion from uh, you know, uh, uh, from prosecutors to to work around that. One of the worst things I think that George Gascon has done in, in Los Angeles is try to limit uh, the ability of line prosecutors to pursue sentencing enhancements, whether it's, you know, we're talking about three strikes or gang enhancements or, or gun enhancements. So those, I think, are the two levers uh, that make the most sense to pull in the short term. But there are a lot of things, a lot of things that need to change. Or yeah, well, this is great. I think we're finally having a discussion uh, because I agree with uh, actually some of what uh, Ralph said. I do think that um, implicit in his first uh, idea um, is, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I do think we agree on this. Um, there's no question that policing does have a bad apple problem. Um, and it's not only that, that, that there are bad apples, it's just um, modern police are just incredibly ineffective at purging uh, departments of the bad apples. And so that I say would be the first problem that I would tackle. I would uh, not permit, I mean, if I had carte blanche, I would not permit police to unionize. I would eliminate qualified immunity and replace it with um, a mandatory professional liability insurance regime to involve insurance companies um, in the process of identifying the highest risk police officers so they could be separated and sent to do other things. Um, and it would also enable police to be the best version of themselves, which I think most of them really do want to be. Um, by rethinking what kinds of things we use police for, it is preposterous that we use police for so much traffic enforcement. That's not what they sign up for. They don't enjoy it. They're not particularly good at it. And it's just a fishing expedition. And that ties into the second big reform that I would implement, um, which is that I would eliminate coercive plea bargaining and I would allow constitutionally prescribed jury trials to once again become the default mechanism by which criminal charges uh, are resolved in this country for, for the following reason. It would force us to be much more thoughtful about which criminal cases are really worth pursuing because we would start having to once again pay the full constitutional freight for each conviction that we pursued. And this would include requiring 12 people to take time off from work or school or whatever else they're doing um, to sit as a jury and sit in judgment of those people. That was something the founders were very, very serious about. It's why half the Bill of Rights is about uh, jury trials. It's why jury trials are the only, or criminal jury trials are the only right mentioned in the body of the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. Um, and our decision to essentially uh, just eliminate uh, criminal jury trials from the system, uh, today about 95% of all criminal convictions are obtained through guilty pleas instead of constitutionally prescribed jury trials, has been an absolute disaster. And it's caused our system um, to become totally unserious in which crimes it pursues. I think Ralph and I would strongly agree that there are definitely people um, who, who are a real menace to society, that, that the law enforcement uh, community needs to really focus on protecting us from those people. But I'm concerned that it doesn't really have time to do that when it's processing 10 to 12 million arrests through the system, 80% of which are misdemeanors. That just has to be a misallocation uh, of resources. And I think if our criminal justice system got more serious about focusing in on the truly bad actors, the people who are really worth 
the expense and inconvenience of a fully constitutionally compliant prosecution, which would include uh, culminating in a jury trial, um, then I think our ability to focus on the true problem actors in the system would be vastly enhanced. I'll ask one more question and then we're gonna throw it open. Uh, and that is, can you comment on both, and, and I actually want to start this way, with the cost of your proposal, like what, what's the thing that keeps you up at night about your own preferred solution? Um, and then if we can get to that relatively quickly, the cost of the other guy. So, I mean, if I, if I understand you correctly, I mean, I think the thing that keeps me up at night is that to the extent that you empower the state to enforce the law, there's always the risk that the state will abuse its power, right? This is something that we have been contending with as a country uh, since the founding. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the sort of idea of modern government really is rooted in a recognition that men are not angels, right? This is something that you see in in Thomas Paine's Common Sense in the Federalist Papers, right? Uh, you know, if, if if men's consciences were clear and always abided, um, then no government would be necessary. Of course, that's that's not the case, right? But whenever you empower the state to enforce the law, there is the possibility um, uh, that they will become drunk with the power that that comes with a government issued badge and gun. However, it is very, very important for us to understand that there are costs on the other side, and I think those costs far outweigh the potential costs that are, uh, uh, you know, sort of pointed to by the kind of anecdotes that that Clark has relied on in tonight's debate, right? And those, and I'll, I'll tell one story to kind of illustrate those costs, and it's a story that really motivated me to write um, uh, the book that I just published, which is a story of a woman named Brittany Hill. She's 24 years old, holding her one-year-old daughter on the south, on the west side of Chicago, in a neighborhood called Austin. Uh, broad daylight, about 9.30 in the morning, uh, in the summer, standing, talking to a few people, when a sedan rode by. Her daughter actually waved to the sedan when the passenger windows came down and the occupants opened fire. Brittany Hill turned to shield her daughter from that gunfire, was wounded almost immediately. She got about four or five steps before she collapsed. Her daughter clung to her neck, and in a last-ditch effort to save her daughter's life, she threw her body over her daughter as the gunfire continued. Right. Eventually, the perps drove off. Uh, Brittany Hill's limp body was dragged to a hospital where she was pronounced dead. That girl's going to grow up without a mother now. Now, because that shooting was caught on video, the police in that case were able to make an arrest fairly quickly. And one of the people that they arrested was a guy named Michael Washington. Michael Washington had nine prior felony convictions, including for second degree murder and another conviction for aggravated assault, which was pled down from an attempted murder charge. Despite being out on parole, having an open case, having that kind of criminal history, he was on the street under the age of 40, free to kill. That is the problem that really keeps me up at night. And it really keeps me up at night because it's a problem that only a very, very small handful of Americans actually understand. Only a very, very small slice of America knows what blood on a hot sidewalk smells like. Only a very, very small slice of America has seen their first dead body before they hit puberty. That's what keeps me up at night. And these are self-inflicted wounds. When someone like Michael Washington is out on the street with nine prior felony convictions, God knows how many prior arrests, how many misdemeanor convictions, when 36% of violent felons have an active criminal justice status at the time of their violent felony, uh, their violent felony offense that they were convicted of, right? When the average shooter in Chicago has 12 prior arrests, when in Baltimore, that number is 10 prior arrests, when you have people who repeatedly flout the law, and don't pay any real consequence for it, that keeps me up at night. The fact that we are gambling with the lives of America's most vulnerable communities. And you know, it, it, it's what motivates me to do the work that I do. It is, I think, our biggest social problem, far bigger than whatever the downside risk is of a robust enforcement uh, apparatus through policing and criminal justice. Mark? Yeah, so once again, I think we're having a conversation finally. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that people like Michael Washington need to be imprisoned um, and, and we need to be kept safe from them. I think our system is relatively ineffective at doing that. Um, you know, Phil, you sent around a link. There was a national review today about how our clearance rate for homicides in this country is uh, has dropped below 50%. Um, we are now, uh, we have the lowest clearance rate for homicides of any developed country. That's a disgrace. I absolutely agree with that. Um, but it points to a problem that, that I've been trying to uh, emphasize all night, which is that we're not getting a good rate of return on our investment in public safety resources, in my judgment. Police have become less effective over time at solving homicides, not more effective. 
The reasons for that are not well understood, uh, but need to be studied more. What keeps me up at night? What keeps me up at night is whether we would be able to sufficiently replace the bad apples who I have proposed separating immediately from the police departments. Um, I don't really know how many it is in any given department. I don't think anybody does, but my estimate would be 10 to 20%. Are we going to be able to replace the 10 or 20% of any given department um, of bad apples with truly high quality police officers who want to do the work. Right now, I'm not confident in that because I do think that uh, there's a morale problem in policing. Uh, I think, as I alluded to near the beginning, um, we're seeing a problem recruiting people into government service, not just policing, but across the board, um, notwithstanding the fact that we spend more money on public safety in this country than any other developed country except Luxembourg, and, we, and we're spending three times the amount on police uh, now that we were um, in, in 1980. So I'm not sure how to solve that problem, but I am absolutely confident that it needs to be solved in order to minimize the number of tragedies of the kind that Ralph uh, uh, described just a moment ago. That is a what he's what that, that is a that is an illustration of a highly ineffective uh, policing operation, I think, um, or criminal justice operation, and definitely uh, needs to be improved. I'll I'll just respond to one last thing I saw in the chat, which is somebody asked why I would eliminate uh, plea bargaining or or re, uh, not allow people to enter a guilty plea. I never said that. What I said was that I would eliminate coercive plea bargaining, and allow constitutionally prescribed jury trials to become the default mechanism uh, for adjudicating criminal charges so that we have more time to devote resources and attention to people like Michael Washington. And we don't have police out there messing around and wasting their time on things like low-level traffic enforcement, drug possession, et cetera, that make up these 80% of uh, misdemeanor arrests that come through our system. Our police need to spend more time on the really bad actors like the one uh, that Ralph described. And if we could find a way to, to uh, reorient the incentives in the system so that they would spend more time on the bad actors, we'd get a better rate of return on investment of tax dollars and we would be protected from the kinds of people that Ralph is concerned about and that I am concerned about as well. So can, can I just jump in really quick? There's uh, there's a lot I want to respond to, but there's just one thing I have to ask, which is that you you know you have said throughout this debate, Clark, that you know you're not a social scientist, that you're not just going to throw statistics around, but you estimated that somewhere between ten and twenty percent of police officers are quote unquote bad apples. What where do you get that that number from? Oh, just from my police officer friends. That's that's a that is I think that's an incredibly um, uh, potent. Uh, argument to make and a statistic to throw out with essentially no basis well, in, in data bad apple is an incredibly subjective term and the idea that there could ever be a precise number of bad apples um, in a given police department is sort of a preposterous concept so well, I well, I'm, glad, I'm glad we cleared that up because it, but it, but so bad apple is not a social science term Rob. good i I'll, I'll jump in here and say you know you guys have have both encountered government bureaucrats at some point in your life, and it is very difficult to walk into a DMV and conclude <laughs> that the police force must consist of sort of only the the most competent members of of our sure. state and local government. Uh, though I, you know, I didn't take Clark to uh, I'll, the risk of sounding like I'm taking sides. I didn't take Clark to be making a, a scientific assertion there. So much as to say, look, this is my guess. And like one problem is it is entirely possible that if we do what Clark says, we've got to replace a fairly significant chunk of the police force. And it's not, it's not a reform that would be, as we've talked about quite a bit tonight, costless. Yeah, I mean, I think if you think that the only bad apples in the Memphis Police Department are the five men who beat Tyree Nichols to death um, during a traffic stop, I'm not saying that you're saying that, but the idea that, that well, you know, um, it, it, we don't, it's, a, it's a de minimis number or not a number that we need to worry about. I just don't think that's borne out by what we do know. Um, so we can debate this all night long, but every department has some bad apples that should not be police. Yeah. Well, I agree I with that, but if we're going to throw out a number like one in five, I think we've got to have a, a substantial basis for that kind of estimate. Too many, Ralph. There are, I think there are too many police officers working today who have no business in policing. I will withdraw the estimated figure. Maybe you can go ask your police friends what they think. I've asked mine what they think. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it to the floor for questions. There are a number of ways that you guys can ask questions. Uh, one is to, to use the Q&A function, uh, probably the ideal way to do it, because it, it will populate a box of questions for me. Uh, number two, you can use the chat, as I've noticed a couple of folks have. Um, or you can use the raise hand function, uh, and then I will I will have FedSoc unmute you, and you can ask your question that way. 
if you choose the raise hand function, here's the thing. Let's try to keep those questions to 20 to 30 seconds. Most importantly, end it with a question mark. Um, and as I said at the top, violation of these rules will result in a member of the Boston College uh, student chapter arriving at your residence to beat you about the head and shoulders of uh, That said, I think Jillian had the first question, which, you know, the, the, the public image of the police force has significantly degraded in, in recent years. And I think this question is for you, Raphael. Uh, what's your explanation for this, uh, if not public commentary on the reality of policing? How does public resistance to the police force factor into some of the solutions you propose? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, police uh, are, are dealing with a real PR problem. And the root of that PR problem um, is not just the fact that some police officers have misbehaved and been caught uh, uh, in that misbehavior, but also the fact that we have, I think, an unethical legacy media institute, a collection of legacy media institutions that have made it their mission to cast light in the least favorable light, to cast police in the least favorable light possible. Um, you know, again, in a country of 330 million people where you have nearly a million law enforcement officers making more than 10 million arrests a year, it is very easy to produce one shocking video for every single day of the year. And in a, in a society where everyone has a camera phone, lots of police officers are wearing body cams, and we have social media networks that will allow things to go viral, it becomes really easy if you are uh, you know, dedicated at this to paint a picture that is incongruous with reality. And I think that's what police are, 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 are dealing with. With right now, they have found themselves behind the eight ball, um, and it's because there has been a very well-funded, well-executed, but concerted effort uh, to cast them in the least favorable light possible. Again, you know, and I think you know Clark illustrated that approach very nicely tonight, right? You know, he says, "Well, you know, we the data doesn't really give us any idea of what things are like." Essentially, um, relieving himself of of the duty to you know to to use any kind of data to to, to ground his argument, and then. then leads with, you know, three or four um, anecdotes, presenting them as if they are representative of the institution by saying things like this regularly happens. And, you know, that I think is is the biggest problem uh, that that is informing why the image of police has been so degraded. Um, and, it, you know, I, I don't think it serves anyone well, no matter what your priors are on this issue. Well, uh, now we're disagreeing, and I think that's fine. Um, I, I think there are, um, I don't, first of all, let's be clear, neither of us knows, but we have our surmises. And I think um, I would I would start by saying that people have come to decide uh, that, that many people feel that they cannot trust police. And I think that lack of trust is well-founded. As I mentioned before, um, police incorporate deceit uh, into their work as a, as a regular tool of, of law enforcement. I think that's a huge mistake. And by the way, uh, European police, by and large, don't, in part because um, uh, admissions and uh, other um, uh, uh, statements against interests that are uh, elicited through deceitful representations by law enforcement are often not admissible in European courts. I think that's I think that's wise. Um, I also think police have a relatively bad track record of policing their own or keeping their own house in order. Um, remember that Derek Chauvin had 14 or 15 different um, uh, substantiated, or in retrospect, at least some of them were substantiated um, complaints against him before he finally uh, murdered uh, George Floyd. Um, and nothing was done. Um, and I just don't think we can wave our hands and say, well, that was just one guy, because we know that it's not just one guy. And when we uh, have examples of police uh, murdering people in the line of duty, uh, as it looks like they did with Tyree Nichols, what we discover is that usually they've got multiple serious uh, uh, disciplinary uh, or, or complaints against them um, where nothing was, was done. Um, and then finally, uh, I think that, that part of the reason why police uh, sort of are held in low esteem is that they're the, sort of the tip of, of a spear of a fundamentally unjust criminal justice system um, that drags people uh, into the system um, and and oftentimes you know kind of ruins your life. It's amazing how fast you can ruin somebody's life, by the way, just by locking them up for a couple of days uh, pre-trial, uh, setting bail at an amount that they can't meet. Uh, people uh, very quickly lose jobs, lose housing, lose connection with their children. Um, so I think we've become rather cavalier about dragging people uh, into a fundamentally unjust or, or, or a system that is often fundamentally unjust. Um, and police, for better or for worse, are the face of that uh, uh, pol public policy choice to just drag massive numbers of people into uh, a system that is often fundamentally unjust. And whether fair or unfair, I think they get uh, blamed uh, by people uh, as being responsible for ruining a lot of lives that didn't need to be ruined. Actually, on the subject of, of the criminal justice system, and I think, Clark, this is a follow-up uh, to the first question you had, which is, you know, what is coercive about 
plea bargaining on misdemeanors that you view as as wasting time and wasting public resources. Right. Well, um, you know, that's a that's a huge subject. And I will say that uh, every case, of course, um, is unique in some sense, but there are an enormous number of highly coercive levers that prosecutors have become very adept at applying to people, which is why so few people exercise their fundamental constitutional right to go to trial in our system. One of the very powerful levers that can be um, exerted against somebody who's been charged with a mis misdemeanor um, is to hold them pre-trial, which is very common. Um, set an amount of bail that they can't meet so that their life begins to fall apart while they're awaiting their trial in jail, and then come and offer them, you know, uh, make a time-served offer um, if they will simply agree to plead guilty to a misdemeanor, oftentimes while holding out the possibility um, of upgrading those charges into a felony. And there's any number of felony charges that you can throw at somebody, including resisting arrest or assault on a police officer um, when, when the underlying conduct itself was just a misdemeanor. So um, I'm not saying that, that that happens in every single case, but talk to any criminal defense attorney or public offender, and they'll educate you very quickly on the extraordinary number of extremely coercive levers that are available to prosecutors, even in what looks like a simple misdemeanor case. Yeah, I mean, I think here's an interesting, you know, another interesting point in which, you know, again, Clark decides the data is useful where, you know, it might support uh, his point of view, right? So we heard a couple of things about coercive plea bargaining, 95% of cases are resolved via plea bargain, right? We, we're, we're told, you know, again, regularly, uh, we have these coercive levers pulled, again, with no, uh, you know, grounding in, in data to make that argument. But one of the interesting hey, Ralph, things you that that 95% number because you never have before. No, no, you did. You no, no, do you dispute it because you never have. I've, I've used that number in every conversation. No, no, I'm not disputing it. I'm just saying that I think it's interesting that you use data when, when you think it benefits you, but then in the next breath say that, you know, well, neither of us has any really idea, so, so we're not going to go the social science route. But again, if we're going to use that kind of data, I think we have to analyze it in context, right? So, you know, again, Clark points to the, the rapid uh, uh, rise in, in, in plea bargaining and says this is evidence of coercion, right? But, you know, one of the things that I, I in preparing for this debate, I, I watched an interview that, that Clark did with uh, Matt Kibbe, where he says towards the end of the interview that somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of people that go through the criminal justice system do something that makes it, quote, virtually impossible to defend them in the case, um, either by uh, accidentally ad admitting uh, their guilt when they're talking to a police officer because they don't know their rights. Um, one of the other things that we've seen is that this data doesn't actually account for the quality of evidence and how that's changed over time. Video evidence is much more common in criminal cases than it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, we have the ability now to pinpoint where people are by tracking their, their cell site location data. Again, something that we didn't have, right? So as the quality of evidence has changed, that's going to inform the rate at which uh, these cases get, get, you know, pleaded out. And the idea that we can just automatically uh, categorize some large percentage of, of, of criminal case resolutions as the result of coercion, I think ignores the fact that, you know, it, th those could just as easily be characterized as gifts, right? I mean, why, why is it, why is it a, a coercive plea bargaining? Why isn't it, um, you know, why isn't plea bargaining actually just an incredible benefit that should probably be reduced? I mean, that's one thing that I do agree with Clark on. I would like to see um, um, people plea bargain significantly less. And one of the things that he doesn't uh, uh, really contend with is the implications for incarceration, right? If we substantially reduce plea bargains, let's say, you know, even by 10%, we're going to drastically increase our incarceration rate because we're going to reduce the churn rate quite significantly. There was one study out of North Carolina that predicted that if you cut uh, plea bargains, I think by 10%, you would have a higher incarceration rate than you did now. Um, and, and so, you know, again, how does that square with the mass incarceration critique? You know, if we reduce plea bargains by anywhere, you know, uh, more than beyond the margins, we're going to significantly uh, increase the incarceration rate. So, you know, I, I just think there, there are a lot of problems with the way that, that Clark is presenting his case. And, you know, again, with the, the policing thing, right, the idea that, oh, you know, they're just wasting their time with traffic enforcement, ignoring, uh, of course, that traffic enforcement is a really important part of law enforcement, not just for reducing traffic fatalities. There's a whole literature on, on that showing that when you take police out of the traffic enforcement uh, game, traffic fatalities uh, go up. And that was one of the other trends that we saw in 2020, right? But it's also really effective means of identifying and discovering contraband and other kinds of more serious criminal conduct. So in 2020, the NYPD made something like 4,500 gun seizures. 42% of them originated as traffic stops. Get rid of traffic stops. You leave a lot more of those guns in the hands of shooters, and that that leads to more crime. So you know, again, well, I think there's a lot of new ones. Can I, can I just want to ask you to, to go back to something, which is what I, I kind of want to get your take on, on specifically this point about 
coercive plea bargaining in the context of, of misdemeanors. Yep. You know, Clark, I think, laid out a, a few of the elements of, of how that happens, of, of the coercive levers that get used. And if you're suggesting that, that we need to reduce plea bargaining or the cost of reducing plea bargaining is in fact more people going to jail, uh, kind of how, how do you handle some of the coercive elements of plea bargaining, which I think it's fair to say come with at the very least some real civil rights costs? Yeah, I mean, well, one thing I think we have to be very clear about is on what basis we're making the claim that some of these coercive levers are being brought to bear with respect to misdemeanor cases, right? I mean, the idea that you have misdemeanor defendants sitting in jail for some significant uh, amount of time is, I mean, I haven't seen data that supports that. I mean, here in New York City, the the, the, the number of people who enter jail who, who are charged with any offense is, is very, very tiny. And the vast, vast majority of people who enter jail as a result of not being able to make bail, even before the bail reform, uh, the average stay was something like one or two days. Right. It's, you know, a very, you're talking like, you know, somewhere around 1% of people who come into contact with the system are spending significant periods of time in pretrial detention. Those people are not facing misdemeanor charges. If you look at the Rikers population, um, I, I think it's something like 95% are facing serious felony charges. Right. So I think we have to be very, very clear about what data we're using to, to kind of make these arguments and ground these arguments. Right. Uh, do, do I think that it's possible and, and in fact, even likely that in some cases at the margins, uh, prosecutors have used um, you know, the, the, the tools that they have in their belt to try and, and, and dispose of a case uh, in a way that's favorable to them? Yes. Does that mean that we should automatically assume that all of those cases are you know, functionally innocent people? Um, I don't think there's any real basis for that. And again, there's there's a cost associated with the other side. Right. There there are. There's a reason why, you know, we're able to process the volume of criminal cases that we're able to process, despite the fact, again, that the vast majority of criminal conduct goes unanswered for, because it doesn't either get reported or result in a clearance. But the idea that we can significantly reduce that, which is what we would have to do in order to significantly increase the rate at which cases went to trial, whether they're misdemeanors or, or, or not, um, would be disastrous for public safety. Can you give Clark the last word on this question before I move to the next one? Because, because you're the one who brought up plea bargaining. So, so fire away, Clark, if you've got a thought there. Yeah, so um, I would prefer to be quoted accurately. That's not actually what I said to Matt Kibbe. <laughs> uh, what, Matt, what I said to Matt Kibbe was that I have asked many of my criminal defense attorney friends what they estimate, what percentage mm -hmm. of clients that they represent said or did something during their initial encounter with law enforcement that made it difficult or impossible to defend them later. The estimate they gave me is 60 to 80%. I'm not a public defender or criminal defense attorney. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I am reporting, I was reporting to him a, a, a number that had been reported to me. So um, on plea bargaining, um, you know, this, I, this is again, a, a much bigger topic. And I think in order to do justice to it, we need more time, but let me give you a, one quick snapshot. I was listening to a wonderful uh, podcast by David Marcus, who's a, a Harvard Law graduate and a criminal defense attorney down in Miami. Um, and he was interviewing um, a lawyer who defended um, the fencing coach at Harvard, um, who, who was charged with accepting a bribe um, along with other Varsity Blues defendants, although he wasn't part of that investigation because it was a different um, setting. Uh, but, but it was the same, same office and same time frame. One of the things that came up during that uh, plea bargain or uh, uh, podcast I thought was just astonishing was nearly every defendant in those cases, and we're talking dozens, was induced to plead guilty. The standard plea offer in the Varsity Blues investigation cases was about two months, and they were overtly told that if they wouldn't take the two-month plea offer, that the prosecutor would go back and, and, and get a superseding indictment in which they would add conspiracy to commit fraud charges uh, where the upper sentence would be 20 years. And of course, they're not going to do 20 years, but that's probably a six to eight year guideline range. Um, and many of them were parents. That is extraordinarily coercive. And here's the real kicker. Four of those cases went to trial. Four defendants uh, rejected the plea offer, went to trial. Two acquittals and two cases up on appeal. One, the, the district court judge overturned the jury verdict because of a misconduct on the part of the prosecutor. The other case is up in front of the, the First Circuit. We may have a situation where all four of the defendants that rejected the plea offer in the Varsity Blues cases 
end up acquitted. That should keep everybody up at night when the government is using such strong arm tactics to induce people to waive their right to a trial in cases where the government might not have been able to get a conviction. I, I, maybe that's not enough for a statistically reliable uh, conclusion, but if the government uh, blew it um, on all four cases that went to trial, which it looks like could happen, that is absolutely evidence of a broken system in my judgment. Thank you. The, the last question that I have uh, in, in my uh, Q&A box is probably one for you, Raphael, and it's uh, do progressive prosecutor jurisdictions disproportionately account for the higher crime rates? I'm going to add a little gloss to this one uh, because my bet is those progressive prosecutor jurisdictions also happen to be large urban areas that happen to be you know, sort of already disproportionate hosts of violent crime. So taking all that into account. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the best thing that we can say about progressive prosecutors right now um, is that we have to just look at what it is that they're doing, right? What constitutes uh, a progressive prosecutor? Well, um, a lot of them have very long lists of crimes that they will refuse to charge should those cases come before their offices. Um, a lot of them will refuse to pursue certain sentencing enhancements. A lot of them, like Alvin Bragg here in Manhattan, will uh, cap the sentences that they will seek. A lot of them, like Eric Gonzalez in Brooklyn, New York, will affirmatively um, uh, support parole bids um, whenever they, they come before um, that particular office. Uh, that particular office. Um, others will um, place limits on their ability of line prosecutors to pursue pretrial detention um, or, or do all sorts of things, right? So the question then becomes is what does the available data on just in the criminology world tell us about what the likely outcome of that is if it's done in a systematic way? Again, given the fact that the typical person who goes to jail or prison is someone who has A, a lengthy criminal history and B, is facing, uh, you know, at least with, with prisoners, is, is, is someone who's been convicted of really serious charges is it are these things wise now we haven't really seen much data um analysis on this i think partly because the progressive prosecutor movement is so young right there've been a couple of studies uh that are very crude analyses one just looked at uh whether a jurisdiction elected um what an outside group termed a progressive prosecutor and what the aggregate uh crime rate uh, did and found a null effect but that doesn't really answer the critique right the the, the question isn't whether you know diverting some first time offender is a bad idea i think everyone agrees that that's probably the right thing to do the question is is does a 30% increase uh, in the diversion rate for people charged with illegal gun possession as felons does that harm public safety, right? And there's no, there's been no effort to kind of follow those cases and, and you know, assess what their impact might be. So I think, you know, progressive prosecution really just has to be viewed as part of this larger movement to decarcerate because that's its mission. And I think we certainly have enough data uh, on who's incarcerated, what their risk profiles are, uh, to know that that kind of pursuit is a misguided one. Are you have thoughts it, on this one? Can, can I just say one last thing too? I do think it it's also has to be at, at some point incorporated into the analysis of you know of course of plea bargaining because progressive prosecutors again you know 40 million Americans are living in these jurisdictions that's a, a big volume of our criminal cases in this country and you know uh, at some point we're going to have to start to acknowledge that that electoral success means that you can't necessarily level that claim with the same force that you might have been able to uh, uh, 10 years ago just because there's been a significant shift in that uh, profession. Are you got thoughts on this one? You, you're not obliged to. Well, I, you know, I'm trying to extract, um, you know, sort of the bottom line from what Ralph said there, and and I don't know if we'll agree or disagree on this, but my sense uh, from the data that I've looked at, but again, not a social scientist, um, is that there's no real clear trend line. Um, if you look at the most violent, uh, the cities with the highest rates of violent crime in this country, um, there's not, you know, uh, they don't fall neatly into in any buckets. Memphis is one of the most, is probably, I think it's still the highest violent crime rate in any city in America. It doesn't have a progressive prosecutor. Um, yes, Saint it does. Louis, what's that? It does. Who? I can't remember his name. I'll tell you in a second. Okay. Um, that's a recent development then. Yes, I, I, it is. He's, he was elected, I think, a oh, year right. ago. Well, let me amend it. 
In 2020, my understanding is Memphis was the had the highest rate of violent crime of any city in the country. I don't believe they had a progressive prosecutor at that time. So the bottom line Steve is, Mulroy is I'm, not a, I'm not aware of anybody who's been able to uh, make a persuasive argument um, that there is a consistent and persistent relationship between you know, having a so-called progressive prosecutor in charge of a given city and overall violent crime rates. Um, I think we agree on that, but I, we may not. I'll close out with uh, with one last question, and this is the time to to hawk your own wares. Both of you have have written and thought and talked about these issues far more than we were going to cover in a you know eighty minute debate. So, best place and the title of the best work to get your ideas, and then I'm I'm curious to know besides you know each other, who's your best or most persuasive counterparty. Oh, interesting. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I think I have to hawk my book here, which is uh, <laughs> Criminal Injustice, What the Push for Decarceration and Depolicing Gets Wrong and Who It Hurts Most. You can get it wherever you get books. Um, but I've written, you know, probably a couple of hundred, um, you know, op-eds, essays, white papers uh, uh, on these issues, including on issues that I didn't get a chance to respond to today, like qualified immunity. Um, so I hope you guys will, will, will check that out. In terms of, you know, who are the people making the strongest case on the other side? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've I've been pretty engaged in these debates for a few years now. Um, had a, a really nice exchange with Lara Bazelon, who I think is smart. Um, you know, we're actually going to be debating again at Claremont McKenna College in uh, a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, Rachel Barkow's book um, was was pretty influential in terms of how I sort of negotiated my argument on on incarceration. Again, I think, you know, she's around people like Patrick Sharkey. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know. Those those are a few names that 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 come to mind of uh, people that you should read, even though I I uh, hope you'll end up disagreeing with them after you do. But I, I think you have to get a complete picture of the other side, and and those are uh, at least the names that that come to mind now. Yeah, so for me, I would say uh, two really good books I recommend to people are uh, Punishment Without Trial uh, by Carissa Hessek, who's a UNC law professor, uh, and it's about plea bargaining. She doesn't take um, quite as hard line approach against coercive plea bargaining as I do, but I think it's a really great uh, analysis uh, of the overall institution. Um, and by the way, um, for those who don't know, the Supreme Court itself has said that ours is no longer a system of trials. It is a system of pleas. Um, and so I think this is arguably one of the most important things that one can understand about our system. So I think that's an indispensable book. And uh, Professor Joanna Schwartz just came out with a book called Shielded. Um, about not just qualified immunity, but all of the various ways um, in which police uh, have managed to insulate themselves from meaningful accountability. I just finished that book this afternoon. As far as uh, uh, counterparts or people on the other side, I had a delightful uh, kind of debate slash discussion with Penal County uh, Kent Volkmer uh, a couple of weeks ago um, in Phoenix, Arizona, and I found him to be extraordinarily fair-minded, uh, willing to you know sort of take ownership of some of the problems in the system, but also a very effective uh, proponent uh, of of you know some of the the ways in which uh, perhaps the system. Um, is more fair and works better uh, than I believe it does. Um, I'm not positive that he's right, but I think he makes a very fair case for his position. Well, I appreciate you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning into our debate tonight. Thank you for your many questions. Uh, Clark, Raphael, thank you for a, for a wonderful and informative and, and spicy debate, uh, as well as being willing to acknowledge your your best uh, best counter argument, and and if I'm looking at my box correctly, Jill, am I am I turning it over to you to to sign off? Yep. Um, for what it's worth, I've heard there's a real shortage of lawyers in this country, so I'm happy that none of us are in fact social scientists. Um, in all seriousness, I do want to say it's so refreshing to see such a civil and passionate debate on a really timely topic, and evenings like this are really what the Federal Society is all about. So on behalf of the BC Law Chapter, thank you to our debaters and to our wonderful moderator, and thank you all for attending. Have a great night. Thank you. Appreciate it.